I'm not super happy where I am right now. I need to start working on some changes. And I, uh, one of the things I could do is I could write a book. You know, it's something I've always wanted to do. Like, why don't, why can't I just do it? When did you move to Los Angeles? I moved to Los Angeles in 1996. And why? Um, I had shot a low budget independent film with some friends of mine in New Jersey. They, they actually already lived in Los Angeles. Uh, they were people I'd gone to school with, film school with. So they, one of them came back to New Jersey, we shot the movie, and then we came to Los Angeles to edit it because another friend of mine was working in a post house and he could get us on the Avids, like you know, after hours at night. Uh, and it was only supposed to be for six months was, you know, was the plan. So I came here with like maybe three grand, you know, and like, and I, you know, and I crashed on sofas and it ended up taking, of course, years, you know, so I, I got, had to get a job and, you know, the years went by. And by the time we finished the movie, I, you know, had a whole life out here at that point. So I said, well, I guess I live in Los Angeles now. So that was uh, how I ended up here. What was your reality like after a couple of years? Hmm, that's a tough one. I, I would say it was probably pretty normal, pretty average. I mean, I, uh, I, I, I got a job at a small production company and I started out as a talent manager's assistant. And from that position, I sort of, you know, worked my way through that company. I don't know if I worked, I don't know if I'd say I worked my way up, but I worked my way to other positions, you know, in that company. And I eventually wound up being uh, in charge of all the camera equipment, production equipment on a TV show that they launched called uh, Blind Date, which was very successful for them and went on for many years. And I worked with them for, I'd say like five or six years uh, on that show. Uh, and that kind of led to other, you know, other jobs and other career opportunities and things, but mostly on the behind the scenes side versus the creative side. So, you know, while that was always going on, I was always in the background, you know, writing or trying to come up with ideas and stuff like that, but most of my work was more technical. And so did you see how if you got like a regular job on you know, reality TV or whatever, you could make a very good living, but maybe some of the creativity wouldn't be? Absolutely. In fact, I would say I, I could have, I think a, a big part of it is like believing yourself and like, you know, putting yourself out there because looking back, I'm sure I could have had more creative opportunities if I'd reached for them. But I think I wasn't, I don't think my confidence was super high at that time. Um, I do know guys that started off as, you know, PAs and went on to become segment producers or story producers. Um, so I, I think absolutely, if someone wants to get into the business, like just, you know, you have to get your foot in the door somehow. So it's take, you know, find a PA job, find an assistant job, just get started, you know, you never know who you're gonna meet or where it's gonna lead you. And I couldn't have predicted, even the path that I took would not have seemed obvious to me at the beginning, you know, so. But then I think you had a, a I don't know if you if get busy living or get busy oh. dying. Sorry, <laughs> oh, let me, you must have read one of my let me, interviews. Let me read it, yeah. <laughs> that came, that actually came much later, you know. I mean, I was out here for many years before that. And I think that's kind of what I mean when I say, uh, I, I don't think, I think, I, I think everything that I ended up achieving, I probably could have achieved about 10 years earlier than I did if I had been more uh, confident and if I'd, you know, trusted in myself and most importantly, not allowed myself to get discouraged. Uh, and I think, you know, you hear this a lot that it's obviously it's a tough business and there's going to always be more no's than yeses. But I think it's, um, you just have to really understand that and prepare for it and just keep you know, keep plugging away, keep trying, keep working on your own things and not, don't be shy about putting yourself out there. Because I, I think uh, that moment you're talking about came many years later, but it could have come sooner, you know, in my opinion, when I look back on my life. Do you think it was confidence or playing it safe? Probably both, you know, a little of both. Um, I mean, what happened with me was, I think I allowed myself to get uh, discouraged early on because I had, uh, like I said, we had made this independent film we moved out here, we finished it. Um, and the film turned out, you know, for what it was, it turned out okay. We did sell it actually, which is rare, but we certainly didn't make a lot of money off of it. Um, not, you know, we weren't, uh, we couldn't stop working. You know, it was a very small deal. Uh, but it, the next thing I worked on was a screenplay for a, uh, a horror movie that, you know, in my dream at the time, which I, to me seemed like a very modest dream. I'm sure it isn't, but you know, I really wanted to work with Roger Corman. He was a hero of mine. And uh, I lo always loved B movies and monster movies and horror movies, those kinds of things. And so I had written this script. It was a kind of a retro 50s uh, giant bug 
movie kind of thing. And it was optioned by producers working with Roger Corman. And I was, you know, on top of the world. I mean, I, I was like, this is it. Like, this is the way it's meant to be. You know, like, like it's happening. And of course, it, you know, it ended up just not working out. I mean, I don't, who knows? I think, I think Roger at that time had some deal with some German financing that fell through. And, you know, I, I never actually met him in person or anything like that. It was just through these producers working with him. And that project just, you know, went away like most projects do. And I think because I had, it, because it seemed so perfect and so exactly what I wanted when it didn't happen, I think that just took, kind of took the wind out of my sails for a while. And it was a long time before I really started putting myself out there creatively after that. And that was a mistake. You know, I should have just kept at it. I was reading, actually read a, uh, a Japanese proverb last night that stood out to me. If you, uh, if you get knocked down eight times, pick yourself up nine. And I think that is the way this business works for sure. Do you know how to say it in Japanese? No. Oh, I, was say, <laughs> I speak oh, I a tiny bit of Japanese, okay. but not, not very much. <laughs> okay. What kind of job were you working when you started writing Tokyo Black? And can you tell us about your get busy living or get busy dying moment? Sure. I mean, first of all, to be clear, it wasn't the, the, the type of job that was so bad. It just wasn't, you know, where I was wasn't a good fit for me. I was doing uh, post-production sales, which I had done before at other places. And I, I, I enjoy post-production work. Like I mentioned, I still do some post-supervising freelance. But just this particular place and the particular, you know, mix of people and, and clients and everything. It just wasn't a good fit for me where I was and I, I wasn't very happy there. Uh, I had also gone through a divorce fairly recently at that point. Um, and uh, I had always wanted to write a book and I'd tried to many times. You know, I'd I probably had four or five like unfinished novels laying around and I uh, I just decided, I don't know what it was, but one night I was like, well, you know, I, I'm not super happy where I am right now. I need to start working on some changes. And I, uh, one of the things I could do is I could write a book. You know, it's something I've always wanted to do. Like, why don't, why can't I just do it? And uh, I had taken a trip to uh, Japan, not super, it was probably made like five years or so before that point, but I really enjoyed it. And uh, I really wanted to go back, but it, it just for timing and money and work and everything, I just couldn't do it. And I thought, well, I could write a book set in Japan and that would sort of be a mental vacation. You know, I could kind of go there mentally. Uh, and so I was like, well, what kind of book would I, could I write there? And Spy Thriller just seemed to kind of go with that location really well, you know, like Tokyo and, you know, think neon lights and secret agents and spy stuff. And uh, so I just sat up this one night and uh, honestly, Almost everything from that book came from this one night of brainstorming where I just, it, it was like a flash of inspiration. I mean, even even the title, you know, I mean, it all, I, I was just like, okay, it'll be about this guy, what's his name, Thomas Kane, and you know, what's it called, Tokyo Black, or what is Tokyo Black? And so all that brainstorming, really almost all of it made it into the book in the end, and that was where that started. Um, however, I didn't finish it around that time. I'd say I got about halfway. Um, and kind of lost steam, you know. It was, I'd never finished a novel, and I, I it's, you know, it's a tough undertaking until you've done it um, a few times. <coughs> but a few years later, I was working at a place that I really enjoyed working at. Things were great. Uh, and I had a, uh, a new girlfriend, and she was over at my apartment. And I don't remember if she wanted to read something I wrote or if it was just sitting around, but somehow she started reading the first half of this manuscript that was like on my desk. And she got really into it. And, you know, of course, she's not an unbiased opinion. So at first I didn't take it too seriously. But she would keep asking me questions about it. Like, well, you know, what's going to happen to this character? Or, like, is, is this guy really the bad guy? And, like, she seemed really invested in it. And that sort of got me to see it, you know, in a new light. Because I think when you're writing, I mean, when you're writing anything, but especially a novel, which is the sprawling thing that's going to take a long time to finish, it's really hard to assess your work, you know, like, is it good? Is it bad? And, it's, and even more so in a rough draft, you know, so I had really didn't know in my head, like, what this was or what it could be, you know, but seeing someone else read it and get invested in it kind of lit the fire again. And so that job was a freelance job. I knew it was coming to an end. And I also knew I had another job with those same people uh, in about two or three months, you know, like they were booked back to back. So I knew I had this gap and I said, well, you know, I, I know I have this two or three month gap and I know where my money is coming from, you know, for the rest of the year. So why don't I see if I can finish this book? 
And I'd say that was the point where I really got serious about writing, where I like made it a scheduled thing and I would sit down at 9 a.m. and work until lunch and you know, I would keep a word count. And uh, I didn't finish it, but I came pretty, I say I knocked off another quarter and that experience of working in that way was uh, very transformative for me. I was like, oh, I can do this. You know, I can actually fit, I can figure out now how to fit this in. And even if I have a job, if I set aside this time here, I can write this many words. And uh, so when that second job finished, I went back to the writing, I finished up the book and uh, you know, it, that, that was the start of it all. How many pages had you written when you kind of shelved it for a little while? Um, it was about half the manuscript. So I would say, uh, you know, in, in, in novels versus screenplays, you really think more in word count than in pages because the page is totally dependent on, you know, formatting and font size and all that. So I, I must have been, the book was about 85,000 words. So I must have been around the 30 to 40,000, you know, word mark at that point. So it was enough that you could kind of start to get a sense of the story, you know, and, and kind of get the flow of it and where it was going because that, you know, that's what led her to, I think, start asking all those questions. You know, an unfinished story is, I think, if you're on the right track anyway, it's like, a, you know, it's like a, a, it's like a itch, you know, you, you just have to know, like, well, where's this going or what's going to happen to this person, you know. And when you sat down that one night where you kind of had this dark night of the soul that I've got to do something <laughs> and poured it out, was this just an outline on your computer or like a... It wasn't even sheet? an outline oh, okay. yet. Mm -hmm. I would say it was uh, just notes, you know, just no random notes. Um, you know, I knew I wanted it to be set in Japan and I wanted it to be a spy thriller. Um, I, you know, there's... In the spy thriller, a lot of spy thriller authors in that community are ex-military or ex-spies. you know, spies, And I knew I didn't have that background. So I said, okay, well, I'll make him a guy who was betrayed and he's on the outside. And then I don't need to know as much about the inner workings, you know, these agencies. Um, little things like that, you know, and I knew, uh, I knew uh, some of the locations and some of the characters. But I, I wouldn't call it an outline. It was more like about a couple pages of just random notes. And then I started making an outline, you know, from that point on. So you wanted to make him sort of this fringe outcast character. I did for, for multiple reasons. Be, a, for the reason I said, because I thought I, I thought I could do a better job with that. And also, I, I'm just always drawn to sort of outsider characters, you know. I mean, in Star Wars, my favorite character is Han Solo, not Luke Skywalker, you know. Um, but also, I think, I, I, you know, I did put a lot of thought into it. I'm a big uh, James Bond fan. And when I, I don't just mean the movies, I mean the, the original books by Ian Fleming. I, I've read them all many times. And so I tried to think sort of of what Fleming did, you know, because those books were written after World War II when Britain's influence was kind of fading. I don't know, this may be really boring, but, yeah, I like but uh, you know, I think he created a hero that fit what England wanted at the time. You know, they wanted to feel important in the grand scheme of things, even though their kind of old world was gone at that point, you know, and their influence was diminishing. So he created this epitome of an English hero, British hero. You know, he's sort of middle class, he has money, but he's not a snob, you know, he's right in that spot. Um, you know, he, he's very patriotic to queen and country, but he's also very well-traveled at a time when many people weren't well-traveled. You know, most people did not get to leave the country back then. So, uh, so I kind of looked at what he did and I thought to myself, well, what, what does that look like for America now, you know, in this time period? And to me, I think Americans are, you know, we're marked by rebelliousness and we are more outsiders. And our, our patriot, or at least my patriotism is more sort of, you know, a little bit cynical. We've gone through some things, you know, that, that, that makes it hard to just sort of take all that stuff on face value. So I just tried to go through that same process of what would not just taking like that kind of character and making him American, but going through that thought process of what would an American hero in that mold be, you know, and that was how I came up with a lot of it. 